Um, okay, well, welcome everyone to week two of the online adaptation planning and practices course. Uh, I'm sure this is getting to be very routine for folks at this point, um, but just a reminder to please uh, keep your sound on mute. When you are not actively asking a question, you have mute control. So you can unmute yourself if you need to ask something or um, interrupt for whatever reason. Uh, and I also see a lot of people sharing their video. That's really great. Um, we love to, to see your faces and start to connect names to faces that way. So um, please continue to do that if you're able and feel comfortable with that. Um, and I see also a lot of people have named themselves uh, from a screen name to an actual name, uh, which is also very helpful for us as we're still getting to know uh, all of, of you guys in the course here. So, so um, go ahead and rename yourself um, if you're able to do that. So uh, as Danielle mentioned last week, we have a big group of instructors for this course, and I realize that not everyone has met me. Uh, yet, and so I want to take a, a minute or two to introduce myself and then let Leslie introduce herself as well. We're going to be the two folks leading lecture today. Uh, so my name is Kristen Schmidt. I'm based out of Duluth, Minnesota. Um, and those of you who are in the Tuesday afternoon discussion group have met me already. Uh, I've been working with NIAX for about 10 years now. And uh, my focus is really on helping people with climate adaptation planning um, outside of kind of our, our traditional geographical footprint of the Midwest and Northeast. So I work with a lot of partners across the country on adaptation planning. Uh, Leslie, you want to introduce yourself too? Sure. So my name's Leslie Brandt. I have uh, been, also been with NIAX about 10 years. I think I started like a month before Kristen. So we, we basically started right around the same time. Um, I work for the Forest Service and uh, as well as um, being part of NIAX, and I serve as the Regional Climate Change Coordinator for the Eastern Region of the National Forest System. And I focus a lot on working with urban areas on their adaptation planning. So um, if you're focusing on urban forestry or urban natural areas for your project uh, and have any questions, I'm the person to ask. Great, thanks, Leslie. Uh, today, we're going to focus on just presenting a little bit of summary information about who is in the class and where your projects are located. And then we'll really spend the bulk of today's lecture introducing step two of the adaptation workbook and some of the key concepts and questions we want to be thinking about um, for filling out that step two. And of course, we'll talk about assignment and homework for next week. So this is, is not entirely complete. I was looking through the most recent iteration of all the projects that folks have gotten started and online, um, but this kind of gives a representation of where different projects in the class are coming from and, you know, what kinds of areas they're thinking about. So, you know, we've got a, a big cluster in the Midwestern states here, which is great. Uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. We've got a cluster out in the Eastern US too. Um, but then we've got a pretty just generally geographically diverse group with some projects popping up in multiple states out West and kind of in um, the, the Southeast roughly and, and Central United States um, and one up there in Alaska. So we've got a really broad uh, group in this course, which is really cool. And I think we'll be able to learn a lot of neat stuff from one another. Uh, Danielle mentioned last week that each week of this course is really going to be focused on a specific step of the adaptation workbook. So as most of you know, last week was really focused on this step one, um, defining where you're working, thinking about a project that you can tackle within the scope of this course, and trying to think about the best way to frame some of your management goals and objectives. And this week, we're really going to be focusing on step two, where we're going to be thinking about how climate change is likely to actually impact the area where we're working. Uh, and to do that, we're going to be gathering and using 
uh, as much information as we can find and that is relevant uh, related to vulnerability of the ecosystems that we're working in uh, in the areas where we're working. So this is really a step where we like to bring in a lot of outside literature and resources on climate change vulnerability. And a big part of this lecture will be pointing you towards those types of resources and things that might help you with this step. Uh, I will also mention that this is going to be one of our longer lectures. Most of them will run well under an hour. And this one, just because there is so much great vulnerability information out there, might run pretty much up to the hour, but we'll try and try and keep it all um, uh, fairly uh, efficient for you. A big part of the challenge in this step uh, and the challenge to being a land manager in general thinking about climate change is this difficulty of translating broad regional vulnerability assessments and climate change information down to the project level scale. So this is a difficult thing and it's where a lot of people get stuck. And so a big part of this step is really focused on how do we take that regional climate change impact information and uh, how do you guys use your expertise and your knowledge of the area to think about how that's going to play out for your project and on your landscape. So some of the key questions we're really asking in this step is how might your area be uniquely affected by climate change and subsequent impacts? How might it look different from what you're expecting in the rest of the region? Or how might you know, those regional impacts that we're expecting be exacerbated or amplified on your landscape. Um, and then that ties into the second question here, how might regional impacts be different in your project area? What characteristics of your project area are going to interact with some of those climate changes that we're seeing? When you go into the adaptation workbook and you mark your project location, uh, that will basically pre-populate your workbook project with a number of regional impacts. And so if you're located in one of the forested areas where NIACS has done a more detailed vulnerability assessment, those regional impacts are going to be pretty extensive. Um, you might have information on specific forest types and their vulnerabilities um, in addition to some more general information about expected climate changes in the area. Um, if you're not in one of those specific um, climate change response framework areas, you will still get a list of statements related to regional climate impacts, and those are all drawn from national climate assessment information, from the latest national climate assessment. And so again, the trick is then thinking about with all these regional impacts, how are those then going to play out in your specific project area? So an example of what that might look like, you know, you might see a general impact statement for your region talking about an increase in average annual temperature, you know, and maybe it'll give you a certain amount of average increase annual temperature under both low and high emission scenarios. Um, in your project area, you might be concerned about hemlock woolly adelgid and temperatures getting um, too warm to really have those cold die-offs of that insect pest in your area. And so if you have an area where hemlock is really important or where you're just kind of on that line where maybe the woolly adelgid hasn't um, had too much damage yet, then that might be a way that this regional climate change will play out a little more specifically on your landscape. Similarly, you know, maybe you have a site that is very prone to flooding already or you've already seen damage from heavy precipitation events. So if you expect more uh, heavy precipitation events regionally in the future, that might be a big um, problem for your particular project area. So these are the kinds of ways that we want you to be thinking about how to drill down this regional information. This is a bit more of a written example of what this might look like. So, uh, and, and this kind of mirrors how it might actually look in the adaptation workbook, the online adaptation workbook itself. So, you know, for example, if you have a regional statement that you expect more extreme precipitation events, 
you might enter in information specific to your property or your project area. So for example, if you already have an area of your property that's vulnerable to flooding and ponding um, because of the slope or soil type, then that's something that you would want to indicate here in this adaptation workbook. Um, similarly, maybe in your area, you are worried about an increased potential for summer drought because you already have areas that are prone to growing season moisture stress. So these are the types of things we're going to try to shake out in this step. So a big part of what we're hoping you'll do this week is, is kind of start with assembling and um, understanding some of the regional information that is out there for your particular area. We have a couple of resources that are listed in the Getting Started Guide, uh, both reading and videos, depending on what sort of format you might prefer. Um, so particularly, again, for those of you who are in the Midwest and Northeast, we have some specific forest-related resources. Um, but for those of you who aren't in one of these footprint areas, please reach out to your discussion leader and we'll do our best to get you um, more granular information about your particular region or ecosystem that you're working in. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of these information sources. Uh, this week is also a really great time to start assembling information about your project area that might be helpful for thinking about climate challenges to your area. So things like maps or tree species lists or, um, you know, flood information are all the types of things that might come in handy when you're really diving into this step. Okay, Leslie, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you. Sorry, um, it takes us a moment to do these switchovers. So I'm going to go through a few of the resources that may be helpful for step two. Um, and there's a really big variety of resources that we have available. And we don't think that everything is necessarily gonna be relevant to your project. So you'll have to pick and choose what you wanna focus on based on the goals and specifics of your particular project. One of the major resources that we have available that's integrated already into the adaptation workbook is, are these regional vulnerability assessments that we wrote and um, worked with um, partners to develop in, in light of developing adaptation strategies. So these are specifically focused on forest ecosystems. Most of them are more focused on rural forests, but there is one urban assessment that is for the Chicago wilderness region. So if you're in the Chicago area or in a, an adjacent area, you might want to look at that assessment. It provides information on projected changes in tree species, projected changes in forests and natural communities, and it examines a range of future climate conditions. So it doesn't make recommendations, but it provides a lot of model-informed um, and expert-informed information that is particularly relevant to managing forest ecosystems. So um, some of the key statements from those assessments are integrated into the workbook, but I'd also recommend if you want to dig deeper, you can download the assessment that is relevant to your area and look at that and, and see if there are some more um, subtle changes that might be more relevant to you. We also have tree species habitat suitability handouts. And these are for smaller areas than those larger scale regional assessments. So they might be at a um, section or subsection level um, within your larger ecoregion or divided by state boundaries so that you can look at um, 
projections for a particular state. There are also some species handouts that are created not associated with a particular vulnerability assessment. For example, we have one for the driftless area in southeastern Minnesota and western Wisconsin that is not part of an assessment. So if you're working in that area, that could be a useful resource as well. Another key resource um, and is um, a main source of the information provided in those species handouts is the Climate Change Tree Atlas. And the Climate Change Tree Atlas was developed um, by our colleagues at NIAX, um, Lewis Iverson, Matt Peters, Steve Matthews, and Nantha Prasad. And it examines projected changes in ha habitat suitability for 134 tree species across the eastern United States. There are also projections for bird species based on breeding bird surveys. So if you're looking at um, bird habitat, that's another resource that could be really helpful to you. So I'll just walk through a little bit about what's in the tree atlas. If you're not familiar with it, the link is, is there below and I believe it's also provided in your getting started guide. These, these um, tree habitat suitability projections look at a range of future conditions that include a low emissions and a high emissions scenario. So this low emissions um, scenario, it's either labeled as B1 or RCP 4.5. That's going to be sort of the best case scenario where you would have some warming, but it would be with a projected decrease in greenhouse gas emissions over the coming decades. This, um, these high emission scenarios are what we are expecting under a business as usual scenario. So if we don't dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, we expect to align with these A1FI or RCP 8.5 um, scenarios. But you can look at both those high and low emission scenarios to give yourself a range of potential futures. A couple more things about the tree atlas. Um, it, does, um, it, it operates at a pretty broad spatial scale. So currently a lot of the stuff that's located in, in the online resource are at a 20 kilometer grid scale. There are some finer grid scale projections that are starting to become available, but still the goal is not to look at a particular pixel in space, but use these as a regional indication of changes in suitable habitat. It doesn't take into account things like microclimates or um, lake effects or the urban heat island, but it does account for soils and precipitation and topography. So it's more than just like looking at um, changes in temperature. So it provides a lot of information um, integrated into this model. It um, is based on forest inventory and analysis data, and so um, it is based on real observations of presence um, and abundance of different species, and then it is um, used to project um, future habitat suitability using downscaled climate projections. So an example of this is honey locusts. So on the left, we have um, a mapped um, suitable habitat for the current habitat for honey locusts. So the red line is Little's range and the um, green and blue indicate areas where we have highly suitable habitat for honey locusts. And then on the right, we have projected suitable habitat for the last 30 years of this century under a low emissions and a high emissions scenario. And what this is projecting is um, in, an increase in suitable habitat for honey locusts in areas like southern Minnesota, southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, and Iowa, and a loss in suitable habitat for places um, like um, Missouri and Kansas. Uh, more recent resource we have available are these one by one degree grid summaries. So if you go to the um, tree atlas, you'll be able to look at these combined summaries and click on these one by one grids. And for every um, one by one latitude longitude area within the eastern United States, there is an Excel file and a PDF file that lists um, changes in suitable habitat um, for 
the species found within that grid cell. Now these might look really complicated at first, so don't get too overwhelmed. And if you have questions, feel free to ask any of us. But the things we want you to pay attention to the most are these um, habitat suitability change projections that are um, labeled as CHNG CL45, which is ch change in climate under um, RCP 4.5 or low emissions and then the 8.5 emissions or high emissions under the, on the right side. So species where you see yellow or no change means that we don't project changes in suitable habitat for that species in that particular location. And when we have a pink or a decrease, that means um, a decrease in suitable habitat and the um, green or in INC stands for increase, so that's an increase in suitable habitat. The FIA sum and, import, and IV, which stands for importance value, lets you know how abundant that species currently is. And so these Excel files are sorted by the most common to least common species within that area. And if you want to look at anything else, there's a definitions tab and you can read through all of that. And if you have questions on any of it, please let us know. There's also a bunch of other information that you can find in our um, Impact Explorer. This is on the Adaptation Workbook website. This provides um, the vulnerability assessment information as well as the national climate assessments. Now this information is already integrated into the workbook for your location, but if you're interested in looking at an adjacent location, for example, if you're working in Kentucky and you're interested in what's projected for the Central Hardwoods region assessment, you could go and look at that assessment by using that um, Impact Explorer tool. As well, um, we have, um, if you, if you click on the Impact Explorer, you can um, look at all of the impact statements that are um, integrated into that particular region. Um, and you can browse that list of impacts. And then there are links to different assessments that are cited if you're interested in digging in even more. So I'll turn it over to Kristen now, who's gonna talk about a few more resources. Hey, Leslie, if you want to keep sharing, that might just be the best way to do it because I don't think I changed any of these slides. Oh, okay. Thanks. <laughs> so in case your head isn't already spinning from um, the resources that we've run through, uh, we want to talk about a few more things that you might want to look at to get a sense of some of those um, regional or um, resource specific climate change impacts and vulnerabilities. Can you go to the next slide? All right, there we go. Um, so one resource that's really nice just to get kind of a quick overview of what's expected in your particular area are these state summaries um, that NOAA put together. Uh, the link below has a list, basically a big map where you can select your state. And these have just a really good overview of some of the basic temperature and precipitation projections on a statewide basis. And I think they either have been Oh yeah, okay, There's um, they, they list their year updated there. So they're in the process of updating these with the latest national climate assessment information. Um, some have been updated to that newer, newest version and, and some haven't yet, but um, that information is all um, pretty, you know, pretty consistent um, even between the, the two latest versions of the national climate assessment. Uh, next slide. Another resource that we want to point you towards are the USDA climate hubs. 
Um, NIACS, our organization, serves as the Northern Forest Climate Hub, uh, but there are several other hubs that focus on different regions or different sectors of the U.S., and many of them have climate change vulnerability information that is more targeted at kind of a land management or, um, in many cases, agricultural producer audience. So this is a good place to go to look for vulnerability information if, you know, you happen to be outside of a forest system or outside of one of those NIACS regions that Leslie talked about. Next slide. And then, of course, we just want to encourage you to delve into your own networks as well. Um, chances are that you have some state-specific resources or, you know, um, maybe resource-specific documents that either cover a particular wildlife species you're interested in or a particular type of ecosystem um, that you might want to dive into for this step. And so if, if you're anything like me, you've probably got a stack of unread documents sitting in your inbox somewhere that maybe you've been meaning to look at at some point. Um, so this would be a really, really great excuse to get some of those out, especially if they're relevant to uh, the types of things that you have in your project area or that you're going to be managing for, for your particular project. Uh, and next slide, please. Um, Next, we just want to, uh, I think there might be an animation in this one, Leslie, but we just want to make sure that folks who are kind of at the, the more geographical fringes of the projects for this particular course, uh, make sure to reach out to us if you want uh, any more specific information about where to find vulnerability information for your region. We realize that you probably have a lot of those resources already, but we can also help point you towards uh, resources if you like. So, you know, for example, out west we work a lot with the adaptation partners that have a lot of vulnerability assessments for different um, national forests and national parks, and in some cases the regions that surround them in the western U.S. Um, California has also got some great state-specific resources on climate change vulnerabilities. So reach out to us and we can help point you in the right direction for some of those if you're wondering where to look. Next slide. And then finally, we just want to mention that there's a lot of other tools out there in addition to the atlas that might be relevant to the types of resources that you're thinking about on your landscape. So, for example, we know, you know, many of you are interested in forests and forest species, but some of you might be really interested in a particular watershed or water resource that's located on your property. And so there are other tools out there that can give more granular information on what's expected under future climates for streams, for example. And this is just showing two different tools that are relevant to two different parts of the United States. Um, one is the Norwest tool that covers stream temperature projections uh, kind of in big chunks of the western United States. And then another one is FishViz that does a similar thing for the Midwest and Northeast. So both of these might be relevant if you're thinking about aquatic species or um, other uh, types of stream resources on your property. Okay, I think that's you again, Leslie. Yeah, so one thing we get a lot is that people might be managing a system where one of the species that they really care about or most of the species they really care about are not in the tree atlas. So what do you do then? We have a number of tools that can help with that as well. Um, in this story map um, that um, our colleagues put together, we have projected changes in plant hardiness zones and heat zones, which can be used to determine um, the planting range for particular species. And so it has this nice slider tool if you wanted to quickly look at how much um, hardiness zones or heat zones are gonna change across the United States. But then there are links to specific um, ArcGIS online maps that you can download um, within this story map. And so once you get to that link, um, you'll be able to um, select different time periods and look at um, different uh, mission scenarios. You can look at that RCP 8.5, which is that high 
emission scenario or the ICP 4.5, which is that low emission scenario under different 30 year periods. So if you wanted to know how much hardiness is going to change within the next 30 years in your particular location, you can click on um, that projection and then you can um, either just view the map right in the viewer or you can download it into your own um, ArcMap or ArcGIS Pro or whatever you're using. So to do that, you'd go to the information tab and more details, and then you can open that in your desktop um, application. So that's a really useful tool if you want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and if you know what the hardiness zones and heat zone ranges are of your particular species. And those can be usually found really easily on the web. If you have trouble finding that information, let us know. We have a lot of that information pulled together already. So an example, like let's say you are interested in um, how habitat suitability might change for Black Hills spruce. Um, you could look up the published um, hardiness zone and heat zone ranges um, on the web for that species. And so um, for that species, the hardiness zone range is from two to eight, and the heat zone range is from one to seven. Then you can look up the current and future projected um, heat zones and hardiness zones kind of over the lifespan of the tree. So let's say the tree is expected to live um, 100 years or you could look through the end of the century. So what is the hardiness zone now and what is the highest projected hardiness zone supposed to be by the end of the century? And the same thing for heat zones. So if you compare um, a species tolerance to projections, if it's within that range, um, which it is for hardiness, then it's, it's probably going to be able to persist. But if the heat zone or the hardiness zone exceeds a species um, range to tolerance range, then you might expect um, a negative impact on that species. You know, we've done a lot of that for you for a lot of urban areas across um, the Midwest and Northeast, and that is available on our forest adaptation website. Um, and so we have that for the Chicago wilderness region, as well as for Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, New York City and the Twin Cities. And we are working on other locations as well. So if there is a location that you're interested in that is not listed and you're working in urban areas or you're working with a more rare species or maybe it's a um, woody shrub and not a tree, um, it might, might not um, show up in the tree atlas. So one, one tip, uh, when you're going through this whole impact um, assessment is um, focus on the impacts to your location. Don't think about your management just yet. We will get there. Um, so just focus right now on how is climate change going to affect your particular location and not and the resources within that location. So that's just step 2.1, where you are documenting sort of the local impacts based on those regional um, trends and projections. The next step will be to determine how vulner vulnerable your forest or management topic is to climate change. So um, what do we mean by vulnerability? Vulnerability is the degree to which a system is susceptible to and unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change, including climate variability and extremes. So in other words, um, what we're asking here is, are climate impacts going to cause substantial disruption to a particular system? You can think about vulnerability as the, a function of the impacts of climate change on a system or a species, and the adaptive capacity of that system or species. So impacts would be things like what, what the system is exposed to. So what changes in temperature, rainfall, or um, other stressors might, be, that, might that system be exposed to? And then how sensitive is that system to those changes? 
And then adaptive capacity considers how well the system can cope with those potential changes. Basically, um, it's, you can sort of think of it as the resilience of that system, assuming no change in management intervention. So an example would be um, a forest containing a variety of northern species might have a greater capacity to adapt to warming than a forest containing one northern species. So more diversity might increase your adaptive capacity. We also want to consider adaptive capacity of individual species and that is incorporated into the tree atlas as well as into the um, urban vulnerability um, at scores that we've developed. So our colleague Steve Matthews and his, and his team have developed this scoring system that looks at a species ability to um, withstand different disturbances as well as to tolerate a wide range of conditions. And these are um, considered to be their adaptability. So a species that has um, very negative impacts of climate change, but has high adaptive capacity because it's able to to tolerate a wide range of conditions, might be able to persist on the landscape, even though um, its overall um, habitat suitability might decline. And how this looks at an ecosystem level would be um, looking at things like species diversity, connectivity, um, age class diversity and genetic diversity. So we don't want to just look at the sum of the adaptive capacity of the in individual species that we're working with, but also overall, how diverse is your system? How able are um, species able to migrate? Um, how, um, how much structural diversity do they have? How much genetic diversity would enable them to overcome a pest or pathogen that should have come through? Hydrological features can also be an important components of adaptive capacity. So um, things like um, thinking about whether your system is precipitation versus groundwater driven or it, the buffering capacity. Um, what are the soils and the slope and topography and wetlands and um, do you have floodplains that could absorb some changes and big changes in precipitation, for example? Um, in this illustration on the bottom, we have kind of a uh, high adaptive capacity system on the left, where the system is able to um, store a lot of rainfall for future conditions. You have reduced runoff and more infiltration. And on the right, you have a lot of impervious surfaces, which lead to more runoff and less infiltration. So you have less adaptive capacity to store that water for later use. So that's one way of considering adaptive capacity. Your location in your watershed could also affect your adaptive capacity. And then also thinking about what's connected to you upstream. If you have a bunch of agricultural fields versus a highly diverse forest, that's going to affect your adaptive capacity as well. And then finally, if you're working in a human ecological system, for example, in an urban area or in a very um, culturally important forest, you might also need to consider the organizational, economic, and social capacity of your system. So for example, what plans or policies do you have that might enable you to adjust your management given climate change? What um, staffing capacity do you have? Is, what economic capacity do you have, either in, in the bank now or your ability to get funding? And then what community support, what networks of people and volunteer base do you have that might enable you to adapt to future conditions? So this might not be something that if you're undertaking a traditional forestry project in a very um, rural area where it oh, has one landowner, some of this might not apply as much, 
But in other cases where you're working collaboratively or working um, where people are a big component of your decision making process, those um, aspects of adaptive capacity can be really huge. So integrating those impacts and adaptive capacity gets to um, determining your vulnerability. So in the adaptation workbook, you um, can choose your own adventure on determining your vulnerability. If you are working in a ecosystem type that was preloaded because it was part of a vulnerability assessment, it will have um, the vulnerability determination that was um, published in the assessment, but you could still change that if your system might be more or less vulnerable than that system type as a whole. Or if you're working in a system that you manually added, it's just going to start at the kind of moderate level and then you can adjust those sliders up and down. So if your vulnerability, if your potential impacts are going to be very supportive to your system and your adaptive capacity is going to be, let's say, high, that would lead you to a low vulnerability rating and vice versa. So this, like I said, has already been done for some areas within our footprint. And that is based on an expert panel that we had done um, for these particular eco regions. So those are preloaded with these potential impacts and adaptive capacity and the summaries are all within those documents if you're interested in learning how we came to that determination. And that doesn't mean you need to keep it at that level if for some reason, let's say you're working in a, um, you know, central hardwoods um, forest type um, in New England, but um, you are in an area that's really invaded with non-native species and it um, doesn't have a lot of diversity, maybe you lower that adaptive capacity a little bit and um, switch it to moderate or even high vulnerability rating. So those summaries can be found in those documents and that's where we list all of these sort of specific things that led to that individual vulnerability rating based on impacts and adaptive capacity. So if the positives outweigh the negatives, it's going to have a lower vulnerability rating. And if the negatives outweigh the positives, then it's going to have a higher vulnerability rating. Now, we walked through a lot today, and we don't expect you to absorb it all now. We're just kind of doing the fire hose thing so you know what's all out there. And you're going to have to figure out what is most relevant to your particular project. And if you're not sure, that's why we're here to help you. Um, so we'll be um, reaching out to each of you um, to set up a conversation over the next week or two. But um, in the meantime, if you have questions right now, I think we have a few minutes and we can answer any really burning questions that you think are relevant to the entire group. Hey, Leslie, I might pipe up with one that came up in the chat, um, mm -hmm. and this relates back to the heat and hardiness zone mm -hmm. uh, GIS files. So some people just mentioned that they use QGIS instead of ArcGIS, and can they still download and use the files that you are talking about? That's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, you can use them right on the ArcGIS online platform. So um, there, and there might be a way to upload them as well. I just don't have that, um, so I don't know if it works, but um, I can look into that. Um, or if anybody else wants to try to play around with it that has that software um, and let me know, that'd be great. I did um, chat Danielle on the side and she thought that the download option should work with whatever program people have. So just downloading the files and using them in, in the system that you have should work according to her. But again, if you have trouble, let us know. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions? 
I may um, have just gotten, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Michelle, and then I'll, I'll um, shout out a few that have come in the chat, but you go first. No, I was just, um, when I was listening, and I may have just gotten it confused in my head for the vulnerability rating. So if it has a high vulnerability rating, that means it's stronger, like the ecosystem is more likely, or did I get that backwards in my head when I was listening? Yeah, so high vulnerability, like you would think, means that it's it's more vulnerable. So it's less resilient, it's more susceptible to changes in climate and degradation. Um, low vulnerability would be those systems that um, have a lot of adaptive capacity and, and resilience. The projected changes in climate are expected to support that system into the future. Okay, that's what I assumed, but then I, when I was listening, I got it. I was like, okay, I must have misheard something. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry if I didn't explain something correctly, but it's possible I got things switched around in my head. And Leslie, we might have a, a quick what might be related question um, related to the, the term high agreement. Um, I can't remember where that was mentioned on the slides, but maybe. Yeah, you can so there. Um, so if you read the assessments, um, there are these confidence determinations that are based on evidence and agreement. And I don't think those are integrated into the workbook online, but um, I think they are useful if you're wanting to understand how the information fed into the overall rating of vulnerability. So this is based on an intergovernmental panel on climate change process for evaluating um, qualitative information where you don't necessarily have a um, likelihood. And so um, if we have a lot of evidence for um, a determination of vulnerability in one direction or another, and there's a lot of agreement among that evidence. So agreement here means how much agreement is there among the models and the projections for that species, then your confidence is going to be higher. And if your confidence is higher, that means that we um, know more about the direction that that species or system is going to change. And so um, for some rare systems, we might not have a lot of information, and so the evidence might be lower. For some systems, we might have um, a lot of information, but it's conflicting, so the agreement might be lower, even though the evidence is high. But you don't necessarily need to go into all of that if you're not interested in it. But um, for people that get really nerdy about confidence, that's what it's about. Right. So, so Jake, I think your, your chat comment is correct. Medium evidence does not necessarily lead to finding high agreement. Yeah. But it, yeah. Okay. They're independent of one another. Any other questions? This is Michelle Grisenda. I just put in the chat a question I had, which was, my project site has a number of fields and meadows. And I'm wondering if you know of any good resources to sort of look at climate change impacts on those habitat types. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so there will be some information in the National Climate Assessment if you look at the biodiversity chapters. Um, and then I think it might require going into the primary literature a bit. Um, and for some of those, we just might not have a lot of information. Um, there hasn't been a ton of work looking at projected changes in habitat across a, a wide range of herbaceous species, just because um, the data isn't maybe as robust as some of the tree species data to, to parameterize those models. But you will find um, some studies for particular species um, that if there's things that you're interested in. Um, but I can try to help you dig up some literature if that's of interest to you. <laughs> 
Hi, this is Mark. Um, Derek, a quick, quick question on how to integrate that data. Um, I've been trying to do that through the worksheet and it doesn't seem to be um, copy and paste. Is it intended to be or is that just my wishes? Um, so I, I'm trying to understand your question. So um, <clears throat> when you put your pin on a location, there should be some information that's preloaded. Now on, you can add a regional impact statement um, custom below if there's other information that's not included. You can also delete um, regional impact statements that might not apply to you. And then where we want you to add more information is in that local considerations text box. And you should be able to um, copy and paste. You might have to do a control V to paste, um, depending on how your computer is set up. But um, you, you should be able to paste in information from other um, documents if you need to. But where we want, what you, we want you to do is really think about um, the species composition and the topography and the soils in your particular location and how um, that might make that system more or less vulnerable than um, the region as a whole. And what are those key impacts for your particular location? So if you're working in a floodplain, you're going to be focusing a lot of, on changes in precipitation and changes in hydrology and um, the floodplain species that are dominant in your, your particular area. Or if you're focused on you know, an upland forest, then you might be focused on the soils, potentially erosion, um, and then those species um, composition of that particular location. Um, if your system, if you're working in like recreation or an urban area, you might add in some human impacts, for example, um, that might not be listed there. I don't know if that helps, but if there's troubleshooting questions that you have, um, if you meet, set up a time to meet with the particular um, instructor that is assigned to you, we can work with you to troubleshoot any of that stuff that might be giving you issues with the workbook. Leslie, if we want, maybe we can go through the last couple slides and then if people have extra questions, they can stick around um, if you have yeah. a few minutes after this. I do. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, this is kind of our slide of pro tips for thinking about step two, but there are much more detailed instructions in the adaptation workbook guide um, that Danielle initially sent out uh, with the materials for this course. Um, but just a few things to keep in mind. Um, first, this is the step that tends to be probably most onerous and long. So don't worry, it will get better after step two. There's a lot of information to take into account in this one. And some people I think are a little bit like ready to throw up their hands when they see all the information that's in the workbook. But that's a big part of the reason that we're scheduling calls um, with your project contact over the next few weeks is to check in and make sure everyone's troubleshooting that without any issues. So, so don't get discouraged just because this step looks lengthy. It is one of the more burly steps that you'll have to deal with. Um, as Leslie mentioned, uh, there should be a list of pre-populated regional climate impact statements, depending on where you dropped your pin. And so uh, you can remove any of those that might not apply to your project location or that you don't really feel the need to elaborate on based on your project area. You just use the X and kind of close those out. You don't need to deal with them anymore. Um, with the remaining climate impact statements, that's where you'll want to get specific, as Leslie was saying, and describe how those might affect your particular property or how they might look different on your particular property. Um, and then there is an option to add in your own custom impact, um, you know, maybe recreation or human-caused impacts, like Leslie was saying, or something that's not included in those pre-populated statements. 
Um, and then many of the vulnerability determinations for specific forest types will be preloaded, but all of those are adjustable based on what you decide about your particular project area. Um, so, you know, if you're, uh, if you're hard bottomland hardwood system you think is less vulnerable than what we rated it in that broader climate assessment that's just fine you can make that decision in this step so again look at that adaptation workbook cookbook tutorial pdf for much more detailed instructions on all of this and there are recorded tutorials embedded within the adaptation workbook if you get stuck on a specific um, aspect of a step is there one more slide, Leslie? Oh yeah, okay. Um, so assignment for next time. Uh, by Monday of next week, we're hoping that everyone gets a chance to look through some of the information on regional vulnerability for your particular area um, at whatever scale you feel is most relevant to you. Uh, of course, contact us if you need more regionally specific information, particularly if you are outside of one of those regions that's covered in the Getting Started Guide. Um, in the Getting Started Guide, there are links to video presentations on climate change and forest impacts for a lot of those Midwestern and Northeastern regions. So you'll be able to find those in there. Um, do your best at completing step two and completing the homework section following step two. Um, and, you know, again, this is all self-paced, but just to kind of keep on track and on target, um, hopefully everyone will, will at least make a big dent in this step by next Monday. Uh, our next lecture will be Monday, May 4th. Again, we'll record that for folks who can't attend it live, but you're more than welcome to attend it live at this time in the afternoon. Uh, we'll be introducing step three at that point. Uh, and then, since we don't have a discussion section, uh, we'll be targeting next week to really check in individually with projects. So one of us will be contacting you um, to try and set up a time to talk. Uh, if you don't feel like you need time to talk on the phone, we can set up an email conversation or start an email conversation as well. But just kind of checking in on how you're feeling about steps one and two and make sure you're kind of getting situated in the workbook okay um, since we're still early on in the course. So um, keep an eye out for emails from us uh, and um, we'll be, be doing our best to follow up on that over the coming week.